With all the record-breaking heat waves, droughts, floods and wildfires ravaging the planet last year, it's pretty clear that the effects of climate change are starting to hit home. And yet, despite half a century of climate communication efforts and increasingly urgent warnings, there is still a remarkable amount of ignorance, denial and stupidity circling around. So today, I thought I'd cut through the confusion and outline five important facts about climate change that we all need to understand if we are to have an informed discussion about the topic. Let's get stuck in. Fact 1. It's not going to get better, but we can stop it getting worse. OK, that might sound like a pessimistic way to start, but it's actually a reason to be hopeful. Kind of. After all, it means the future is very much in our hands. So what's the science here? Well, the world is warming because we are pumping billions of tonnes of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Like a giant blanket, these gases slow heat loss from the planet and raise its temperature. Which is normally a good thing, since without this blanket, the planet would freeze. But as every small child let loose in a candy store has found out, you can have too much of a good thing, and if you rapidly pump billions of tonnes of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, the Earth will heat up dangerously fast. And right now, it's heating up over 10 times faster than at any point in the history of civilization, and temperatures are already higher than at any point in at least the last 100,000 years, and they're still rising. Importantly, all of this is caused directly by human emissions of CO2. The more CO2 we put up there, the hotter it'll be down here. Now, there are some natural processes which can pull some of this carbon back out of the atmosphere, but the amount that they can absorb has limits, and we've already put so much into the atmosphere that it would take tens of thousands of years for natural processes to absorb everything we've produced so far. Which means that, as far as humans are concerned, all the CO2 we add to the atmosphere is effectively going to stay there forever, and the global warming that it causes is, to all intents and purposes, permanent. In other words, even if we stopped emitting greenhouse gases today, all the record-breaking heatwaves, wildfires and droughts that we've seen over recent years would be here to stay. So the bad news is it's not going to get better, which sucks. But the good news is that it will stop getting worse as soon as we stop pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. From a physics perspective, it really is as simple as that. Which leads me on to the next important fact. Fact 2. Reducing emissions isn't enough. We have to eliminate them entirely. This may seem obvious after the last point, but it is worth emphasising. Since temperatures will continue to rise as long as atmospheric CO2 continues to rise, the only way we will stop global heating is if we stop emitting CO2 entirely, or at least get to a point where whatever we emit is so small that it no longer changes the concentration in the atmosphere. This state of affairs is known as net zero, which contrary to popular belief isn't a Europop band from the 90s, unfortunately. Now, to listen to coverage of net zero in the media, you'd be forgiven for thinking that it's a fringe or optional political position, or something we can worry about in the future, if at all. Which, sure, it is, if you don't mind committing to an indefinitely heating planet and a forever worsening climate. But for those of us who enjoy, say, having food or water security, then net zero is rather more urgent, and arguably essential for human prosperity and possibly even our survival. Now, that may sound hyperbolic. I have no doubt I'll be called an alarmist by some. But the bottom line is that climate change will keep getting worse until we stop adding carbon to the atmosphere. That's just physics. If you increase gases that restrict heat loss from the planet, then heat will inevitably accumulate in the atmosphere. And it doesn't take a genius to realise that a perpetually worsening climate will eventually threaten our existence. Now, we don't know exactly where the breaking point lies, but since every tonne of fossil fuels we burn brings it closer by locking in irreversible heating, we have to make net zero an urgent priority. 
So the next time you hear someone suggesting that we need to increase our use of fossil fuels, delay emission reductions, or push back our net zero targets, understand that they are tacitly advocating to make current climate change worse, not only in our lifetimes, but for every future human generation for centuries to come. Which, you know, isn't great for civilization, and perhaps more importantly, will be really, really, really bad for the economy. Which, as we all know, is the most important thing in the entire world. At least according to most of the politicians advocating for that nonsense. Anyway, you get the point. If we want to stabilise the climate and stop the planet from perpetually getting hotter, we have to eliminate our emissions and reach net zero. That's not a political opinion, that's basic physics. Actually doing that, however, may be a little less straightforward, but there's reason to be optimistic because… Fact 3. We have all the tools we need to fix it now. Yes, that's right. Despite what certain fossil fuel enthusiasts will have you believe, we already have viable, economical, and efficient means to get ourselves off fossil fuels. And yes, it is overwhelmingly fossil fuels that are the problem. Now, there are other things which can contribute to global warming, like deforestation or animal agriculture. But the fact is, if we can crack our fossil fuel addiction, we're like 90% of the way there. And encouragingly, over the last 10 years, renewable energy technology has come on in leaps and bounds. Wind and solar, for example, are now often cheaper than fossil fuels for most of the world's countries. I'll repeat that because for some reason there are folks out there who insist the opposite is true. Wind and solar are often cheaper than fossil fuels. In fact, according to the IEA, solar is now the cheapest energy in history. So if you want cheap energy, as many so-called climate skeptics profess to, you should want wind and solar. And even more encouragingly, renewables in general are rapidly increasing their share of the energy grids of many countries, much to the annoyance of the fossil fuel PR machine, which is doing everything it can to convince you that without fossil fuels, our energy prices would soar and we'd return to the pre-industrial dark ages. Given the fact that energy prices already soared as a direct result of an overdependence on the fossil fuels they're trying to flog us, these claims ring somewhat hollow. One could even call them alarmist. Claims that renewables are too costly are undermined further when you look at actual economic forecasts for green energy. For example, a recent Stanford study calculated that the cost of reaching net zero will pay for itself within just six years of decarbonising, creating millions more jobs in the process. Similarly, an Oxford University study concludes that, quote, a rapid green energy transition will likely result in trillions of net savings. And remember, a green energy transition doesn't have to rely solely on renewables. There are other alternative energy sources like nuclear or biofuels, and we can and are improving energy efficiency as well as rapidly developing energy storage technologies. And if you're interested in learning more about how technological advances are helping to create a greener future, then check out Earth Rescue, an online docuseries that I spent half of last year filming. I had the privilege of meeting engineers working on everything from floating wind turbines and electric aviation propulsion to carbon capture and nuclear fusion. You can watch it all for free via the link in the description. Anyway, where was I? Ah oh yes, the point is that we have multiple, viable, and increasingly cheap solutions for reaching net zero, and there are a myriad of economic benefits in doing so. All that is required is the public and political will to invest in a green future and to stand up to the fossil fuel lobby. Seriously, those guys have a scary amount of influence over policy decisions. They lobby against climate action, fund think tanks that spread misinformation, and send more delegates to international climate summits than virtually every country on the planet. But regardless. Even with these corporate giants slowing us down, many countries are already making significant progress on decarbonising. So it's no longer a question of if we reach net zero, but when. However, when considering how we may get there, make sure you remember that. Fact 4. 
There is no magic bullet. That's right, there is no single one-size-fits-all solution to climate change. This should be obvious, but there are plenty of people who may tell you otherwise, from nuclear nerds and geoengineering dweebs to carbon capture bros. The reality, as ever, is not as simple. And yes, I know that earlier I said it was as simple as halting our emissions of greenhouse gases, but it turns out that that's not actually simple. Because although we have many tools in our arsenal, all of them have challenges and none of them can single-handedly address all our emissions at once. For example, although solar and wind can supply abundant, cheap energy, they can only provide it intermittently. Which means, in the near term at least, we will have to rely on more expensive but more consistent energy sources, perhaps hydropower, nuclear or biofuels, to ensure that our energy demands are met. We'll also need to deploy more efficient and more creative forms of energy storage, invest in better, more efficient public transport, make our cities bike and pedestrian friendly, and generally reduce the resource intensity of our lifestyles. The list of what we can do is endless. The point is, we can't rely on a single solution, because there is no single solution. And anyone who tells you otherwise is either uninformed or trying to sell you something. Instead, we should deploy multiple, complementary solutions depending on geographic and economic contexts. Now, at this point, you might be thinking that deploying renewables and redesigning our cities sounds great, but unless you're Bruce Wayne, Tony Stark, or one of the far less cool and way more disappointing real-world billionaires, it's not something that you, as an individual, can do much about. And that leads me on to the final, and perhaps the most important fact. Fact 5. There are things that you can do right now. Yes, that's right. You can contribute to reaching net zero. So what can you do? Well, that depends a lot on where you live and your immediate circumstances. I can't give you specific guidance, because I don't know you personally. But unless you live somewhere like North Korea, I guarantee you can do something. And it doesn't have to be much. Small actions repeated by millions of people add up pretty fast. It could be as simple as educating yourself or friends and family about climate science and climate solutions, or perhaps getting involved with local government and advocacy groups. You could vote for climate-friendly politicians or write to your representatives. And then there's modifying your day-to-day -day habits as a consumer. Eating less red meat, driving less, using public transport more. You get the idea. All of these actions can make a difference, particularly when combined together. And if you're looking for help and guidance with what you can do, I provided links to several useful online resources in the video description. And to be clear, I'm not suggesting that you are personally responsible for climate change, or that you alone can fix it. You're not, and you can't. But you are responsible for your choices, and you can choose to be a part of the solution, as millions of others already have. Climate activism can feel very lonely and isolating. Trust me, I know. But you're not alone. And while our individual actions will never be sufficient without corporations and governments on board, they are still absolutely necessary, and can be far more powerful than you might think. After all, Corporations and governments are made up of individual humans just like you. Well, maybe not just like you, but at the end of the day, they are just people. So never let anyone tell you that there is no hope or that there's no point in doing anything, because there absolutely is. The only people that benefit from that kind of thinking are those who are invested in the fossil fuel status quo. And if you're looking for a good way to start your climate-friendly journey, well, try sharing this video with people who might need to hear this message. My name's Rosh, this is All About Climate, and thank you for watching.